We live from New Delhi you're watching the India News on India's Voice to the World. I'm Lipak Shikrana coming up in the next hour. Israel reduces troops in South Gaza leaving just one brigade. Egypt state TV says progress made in discussions in Cairo truce talks. IAEA condemns drone attack on Zaporizhia nuclear plant says attack significantly increase accident risk. Election campaign picks momentum for parliamentary polls in India. Top leaders of various political parties to hold multiple rallies and road shows to garner support for their candidates. A total solar eclipse is set to occur on Monday. Mexico, US and Canada to witness solar eclipse will not be visible from the Indian subcontinent. And starting with update on Israel-Hamas conflict now, Israel on Sunday said it had withdrawn more soldiers from southern Gaza, leaving just one brigade in the area. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said the troops were leaving to prepare for their follow-up missions. Gallant said their achievements in Khan Yunis were extremely impressive, adding that Hamas had ceased to function as a military organization throughout Gaza. The forces are exiting and preparing for their next missions. We saw examples of such missions in the Shifa operation and also of their coming mission in the Rafah area. While well, U.S. says the Israeli military's troop production in the southern Gaza Strip appears to be a rest and refit and not necessarily indicative of any new operations for these troops. In an interview to a news channel, White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby reiterated the United States' position against any ground military operation in Rafah. Kirby's remarks came as Israel's military announced it had withdrawn its forces from Khan Yunis and bringing its troop presence in the territory to one of the lowest levels since the six-month conflict began. And Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel was one step away from victory. Marking the six months of the conflict, Netanyahu said Israel would not agree to a ceasefire until the hostages being held in Gaza are released. Netanyahu said that despite growing international pressure, Israel would not give in to extreme demands from terror group Hamas, which sparked the conflict on October 7th with its deadly attack on southern Israel. I made it clear to the international community there will be no ceasefire without the return of hostages. It just won't happen. This is the policy of the Israeli government and I welcome the fact that the Biden administration made it clear two days ago that this is still its position as well. I would like to clarify one more thing. Israel is not the one preventing a deal. Hamas prevents a deal. Israel is ready for a deal. Israel is not ready to surrender. Well, progress has been made in discussions in Cairo on a truce in the Israel-Hamas conflict and there is agreement on the basic points between all parties involved. According to Egypt's state-affiliated Al-Kahara News, Hamas and Qatar's delegation left Cairo and will return within two days to agree on the terms of the final agreement while the Israeli and the U.S. delegations left the Egyptian capital later on Sunday. It added that consultations were ongoing during the next 48 hours. Hamas also reiterated on Sunday their demands including a permanent ceasefire, the withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza, a return of the displaced and an exchange of Palestinian prisoners for Israeli hostages being held in Gaza. Well, Iraq agreed on Sunday to send 10 million liters of fuel to the Gaza in support of the Palestinian people. Iraq's Prime Minister Mohammad Shia al Sudani in a statement said that Iraq also agreed to receive wounded Palestinians from Gaza and provide them treatment in government and private hospitals. The lack of fuel has crippled hospitals, water systems, bakeries and relief operations in the Gaza Strip.
Well, thousands of protesters rallied in Jerusalem on Sunday, demanding the release of around 130 hostages still held in Gaza after six months of conflict. Freed hostages, relatives of those still in Hamas captivity and parents of slain soldiers all spoke at the Sunday night demonstration in Jerusalem. Crowds thronging Jerusalem's Kaplan Street carried signs with photos of those kidnapped by Hamas and wearing the iconic yellow ribbon symbolic of the hostages' plight in front of a Nesset lit up in yellow in the honor. While some hostage parents at Sunday's rally carried on, called on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to do more to bring home the hostages, speakers largely kept messages of political, focusing on their pain and the urgent need to get their loved ones back home. Well, alongside the estimated 50,000 participants who demonstrated outside the Nesset, thousands more people gathered for rallies with relatives of captives in cities across the West, including New York, Berlin, London and Washington, D.C. Hundreds gathered in New York City over the weekend, demanding the release of hostages still held by Hamas in Gaza. The demonstration and supporting rallies worldwide came as Israel and Hamas both dispatched delegations to Cairo for a fresh round of talks. Well, UN's atomic watchdog agency IAEA has condemned a Ukrainian drone strike on one of six nuclear reactors at the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. In a statement on the social media platform X, Rafael Grossi confirmed at least three direct hits against the ZNPP main reactor containment structures took place. He added such attacks significantly increased the risk of a major nuclear accident. Grossi said it was the first such attack since November 2022 when he set out five basic principles to avoid a serious nuclear accident with radiological consequences. In a separate statement, the IAEA confirmed physical impact of drone attacks at the plant, including at one of its six reactors. UN's atomic watchdog agency said the damage at Unit 6 has not compromised nuclear safety, but this is a serious incident with potential to undermine integrity of the reactor's containment system. The power plant has been caught in the crossfire since Moscow sent troops into Ukraine in 2022 and seized the facility shortly after. The IAEA has repeatedly expressed alarm about the nuclear power plant, Europe's largest amid fears of a potential nuclear catastrophe. Both Ukraine and Russia have regularly accused the other of attacking the plant, which is still close to the front lines. And Russia's nuclear power corporation Rosatom accused Ukraine's military on Sunday of launching a series of attacks on the Russian held Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the UN's nuclear watchdog called for such incidents to cease immediately. A Rosatom statement said the first strike on the plant hit an area near a canteen, injuring the three staff members. Within a half hour, it said a drone had attacked a cargo loading area and another drone subsequently struck the dome of the sixth reactor. Russia urged the world leaders to denounce the incidents. Both Russian officials and the UN's International Atomic Energy Agency said radiation levels were normal and damage not severe. A Ukrainian intelligence official said Kyiv had nothing to do with any strikes on the station. While well, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg seems to suggest that Ukraine would have to compromise on possible negotiations with Russia. In an interview to the BBC, which was published on Saturday, Stoltenberg clarified that the West would support Ukraine in the long term. He said Western countries would invest in Ukraine's defense capabilities to make it more resilient to future strikes. This report puts recent developments into the context. Just a few days ago, on the 4th of April, NATO members celebrating the 75th anniversary of the strongest military alliance in history with pledges to support Ukraine to the very end. 
Today we will address uh, Ukraine's urgent practical and political needs, including how to strengthen NATO support for Ukraine. At Vilnius, we agreed a package of measures to bring Ukraine closer uh, to NATO. And as we prepare for our Washington summit, we are working together to cement Ukraine's path towards NATO membership. This matters for Ukraine's security and for our security. However, the funding plan for Ukraine doesn't seem to have the entire backing of the Security Alliance with reports suggesting not all members agree. NATO chief Stoltenberg had proposed creating a 107 billion US dollars five-year fund to support Ukraine. But the idea drew mixed responses from NATO members. Then came an interview to the BBC published on Saturday in which Stoltenberg has said, and I quote, even if we believe and hope that the war will end in the near future, at the end of the day, it has to be Ukraine that decides what kind of compromises they are willing to do, unquote. He added that the West's role is to help Kiev reach a negotiating position that could produce an acceptable result. He, however, did mention that he was not pushing Kiev toward any concessions, emphasizing that the real peace can only be achieved with the Ukrainian victory. It is clear that extending support and aid to Ukraine emerged as a contentious topic among NATO member countries as foreign ministers met for two days of talks at the alliance headquarters in Brussels, Belgium, concluding on Thursday. NATO alliance members had agreed to scour their arsenals for more air defense systems to protect Ukraine from Russian ballistic missile attacks. He said. NATO is not party to the conflict, and NATO will not be party to the conflict, uh, but NATO is providing support to Ukraine to help them de defend themselves. And we just have to remember again and again what this is. This is one country, Russia, attacking another, invading another country. Russia claims it is open to talks with Ukraine, but asserts that Ukraine must accept its borders have changed drastically since the start of the military operation. Ukraine advocates a 10-point peace formula demanding that Moscow withdraws its troops from territories it has occupied, apart from a tribunal to prosecute Russian war crimes. This is a position Moscow says is detached from reality. Ukrainian President Zelensky, in remarks published on Saturday, said his country is awaiting a much-needed large-scale aid package from the United States and that he still believes will get approval from the US Congress. He also hopes the setup of a peace summit in Switzerland with around 100 countries participating. If there is any hint in a change of stance, Zelensky suggested last month that a return to Ukraine's 1991 borders was no longer a precondition for negotiations. He still insists that Kiev must regain its territories annexed by Moscow in 2022. Bureau Report, DD, India. Well, the US, Britain and Australia are set to begin talks on bringing new members into the AUKUS Security Pact as Washington pushes for Japan to be involved as a deterrent against China. The country's defense minister will announce discussions on Monday as Pillar 2 of the pact, which commits the members to jointly developing quantum computing, undersea hypersonic, artificial intelligence and cyber technology. The newspaper reported on Saturday, citing people familiar with the situation. AUKUS, formed by the three countries in 2021, is part of their efforts to push back against China's growing power in the Indo-Pacific region. China has called the AUKUS pact dangerous and warned it could spur a regional arms race. And still to come on DD India News now. Mexico says it will file a complaint against Ecuador at the International Court of Justice following the raid on its embassy in Quito. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov will be on a three, two day visit to China. And Muslims around the world prepare to celebrate Eid al Fitr.
the land of Dravidians, Tamil Nadu goes to polls in one go. How will the National Party's alliance face the political heat with the regional satraps? What are the issues that could find resonance among the voters as India decides? Will the vote share increase help the National Parties get a foothold in the minds of the people? Watch Why Tamil Nadu Matters on the Great Indian Election at 8.30 p.m. IST and 1500 hours GMT only on TV India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Lepakshi Quran and moving on, Mexico's diplomatic personnel are leaving Ecuador after the two countries severed their ties. This comes after a growing rift between Mexico and Ecuador, which had been going on for days and culminated on Friday after Mexico granted political asylum to Ecuadorian Vice President George Glass. The raid has prompted criticism across Latin America, the United States, Honduras, Spain, the European Union, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres also condemned Ecuador's decision, saying that it violates the sanctity of diplomatic and consular property. Spain and the European Union joined the United Nations chief and Latin American countries in criticizing Quito for their raid. And Mexico also said it will file a complaint against Ecuador at the International Court of Justice following the raid on its embassy in Quito. Mexican diplomatic personnel left Ecuador on Sunday as the two countries severed ties. Mexico Foreign Minister Alicia Barzana welcomed the return of its embassy personnel and lashed out at Ecuador's raid on the embassy and praised the diplomatic staff for defending the embassy. Alicia Barzana said at the event to welcome the diplomats home that we are going to the ICJ where we are presenting this sad case and we believe that it, we can win this case quickly, she said. Meanwhile, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov will be on a two-day visit to China on Monday and Tuesday. Lavrov will discuss the Russia-Ukraine conflict and deepening partnership between Moscow and Beijing with Chinese counterpart Wang Yi. Also, the China Coast Guard on Sunday claimed that Philippine vessels trespassed into waters adjacent to the Houting Reef in the South China Sea. The Chinese Coast Guard released a video that showed several Filipino fishing vessels fishing at water surrounding the Houting Reef, where Philippine official vessels were also present. A China Coast Guard spokesman said in a statement that the Philippines organized multiple vessels to conduct illegal activities in the waters adjacent to the Houting Reef of China's Nancha Islands. Early on Saturday, the Philippines said the two Chinese Coast Guard vessels harassed Filipino fishing vessels within Manila's exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea. The Philippines and China had several maritime run-ins last month that included the use of water cannon and heated verbal exchanges, which have triggered concern about an escalation at the sea. Also, Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky on Sunday said that the world must finally hear the pain inflicted on Kharkiv and other cities by Russian attacks. On Saturday, eight people were killed and at least ten were injured in two Russian strikes on Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv. In his nightly video address, Zelensky thanked the countries that had already contributed and said there were defense systems in the world that can help. There are eight different systems in the world that can help. All we need is the political will to transfer these systems to Ukraine. I thank those countries that have already contributed. It is the personal responsibility of our diplomats to be active in this task, work in areas and countries that possesses essential systems. At the moment, Patriots should be used in Ukraine so that they would not have to be used across NATO's entire eastern flank in the future. Meanwhile, one woman died after shelling in the outskirts of Russian-controlled Malivka city in the Donetsk region on Sunday. Makivka has been controlled by pro-Russian self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic since 2014 and has come under shelling numerous times.
Also, the Sayan Range March a Snowfield Combat and March Competition open on Saturday in Russia. It is part of the International Army Games with nine teams from seven countries, including China and Iran, in attendance. On the first day, the teams competed in six disciplines, such as avalanche search and rescue, casualty delivery and group firing. The Chinese People's Liberation Army dispatched a men's team and a women's team to the competition. The two-stage competition will last for two days and one night, during which each team member is required to complete 12 courses and march more than 50 kilometers in the snow field. The final score will be calculated based on the time spent on finishing the task and penalty points. Well, an engine cover, also called, called cowling, on a Southwest Airlines Boeing 737-800 fell off on Sunday during takeover in Denver and struck the wing lamp. No one was injured in Southwest Flight 3695 returned safely to Denver International Airport, but the incident has prompted the U.S. Federal Aviation Agency to open an investigation. The Boeing aircraft, bound for Houston Hobby Airport, with 141 people aboard, rose to an elevation of about 10,300 feet before returning back. And moving on, Argentina is facing an insect repellent shortage as the country prepares for its worst ever dengue season. According to a report, mosquito repellents have been sold out in virtually all of the stores across the capital city of Buenos Aires. The repellents are being sold for exorbitant prices online, in some cases as much as 10 times the retail price. More than 120,000 cases of dengue have been recorded so far in the 2023-24 season. Rampart, hoarding and surging prices of repellents have stoked to desperation among the citizens. The government in Argentina, which is already battling sky-high inflation levels, was forced to intervene. The authorities have lifted import restrictions on foreign-made mosquito repellents to boost supply and announced they would ramp up production at the local labs. Well, former U.S. President Donald Trump has, according to his campaign, raised more than $50 million in one night at a Florida fundraiser. As a Washington correspondent, Jagruti Dave reports, Mr. Trump is still playing catch-up on campaign finances with his rival Joe Biden, even though this latest haul is twice what Mr. Biden raised at a New York event last month. This apparently record-breaking fundraiser was hosted by billionaire John Paulson at his Palm Beach home on Saturday. Donald Trump is courting major donors to try and bridge the funding gap between himself and his rival, the U.S. President Joe Biden. According to Mr. Biden's campaign, he went into April with $192 million. That's compared to Donald Trump's $93.1 million. Now, Donald Trump gave... Uh, a 45-minute speech at this event to uh, an audience of almost 120 people. That's according to uh, some people who were there. And some attendees reportedly paid, uh, reportedly donated $814,600 uh, for the event. According to a campaign spokesperson, Donald Trump spoke about issues including immigration, energy, and he called on Joe Biden to debate him. Uh, what else do we know about the event? Melania Trump, the former first lady, was there, as were Donald Trump's former Republican rivals, Vivek Ramaswamy and Senator Tim Scott. And of course, on the dinner menu, uh, we've got a bit of information. There was filet au poivre and a pavlova with fresh berries. Jagruti Dave in Washington reporting for DD India. Well, South Korea's defense ministry said on Monday that country's second domestically made spy satellite was successfully put into orbit. The satellite was launched from an American space center on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The launch, which comes after Seoul's first spy satellite, was put into orbit from California's Vandenberg Space Force Base in December, was live-streamed on social media platform X and YouTube. The Falcon 9 rocket was launched at 2317 GMT on Sunday and the satellite 
satellite successfully separated from the launch vehicle 45 minutes later and entered its targeted orbit, the ministry said in a statement. It made successful communications with the ground station about 2 hours and 40 minutes after the launch. Seoul's second spy satellite is equipped with a synthetic sparture radar capable of producing images regardless of weather conditions due to how it processes data. The back-to-back -back launches of reconnaissance satellites come amid a race against North Korea for military capabilities in space. And former Thai Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawatra is scheduled to meet with the public prosecutor on April 10th to hear the Attorney General's decision on whether to indict him on a Lee's Majestic case. The complaint made by the military that ousted his sister Ying Lak Shinawatra's government stems from an interview Thaksin gave while in exile in 2015. Insulting the monarchy is a serious offence and a major slur in Thailand where the constitution states the king must be held in a position of revered worship. Hundreds of people have been prosecuted in recent years and the Thailand's less majestic law, which is among the world's strictest and carries a maximum jail sentence of up to 15 years for each perceived royal insult. And Muslims around the world will soon bid farewell to the Islamic holy month of Ramadan and start celebrating the holiday of Eid al-Fitr. Eid is marked with congregational prayers and festivities that typically include family visits, gatherings and new clothes. Eid al-Fitr is an Islamic holiday marking the end of Ramadan, the month when devout Muslims fast daily from dawn to sunset. Ramadan is a time of increased worship, charity and good deeds. With Eid al-Fitr around the corner, people in Bangladesh continue to leave cities to celebrate with their families. Passengers in large numbers were seen rushing to Dhaka railway station, bus and launch terminals to avoid last hour hassle and chaos. Various stretches of the highway reported long queues of vehicles leaving Dhaka. According to an estimate, around 15 million people, two-thirds of greater Dhaka inhabitants, may travel to other parts of Bangladesh to celebrate Eid. And for more on this, we have a correspondent, Naval Singh Parmar, joining us from Bangladesh. Well, Naval Singh, good morning. Eid al-Adha celebrated all over Bangladesh uh, with great fervor. Uh, how are the preparations going on there? Uh, <clears throat> Eid is expected to fall on 11th uh, April here in Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, since the uh, last weekend, means Friday and Saturday, many people are living for their uh, hometown and uh, their home in countryside. As uh, Dhaka is considered as a uh, political as well as administrative capital and at the same time RMG sector of Bangladesh is centered around uh, Dhaka and uh, nearby districts of Dhaka. So around uh, 15 million people will uh, travel to other part of Bangladesh to celebrate the Eid. So uh, almost two thirds of population of uh, Dhaka uh, will travel to other parts of Bangladesh and hence the uh, streets in Dhaka are seems now uh, uh, sparsely uh, uh, populated and the many people are moving towards the countryside to celebrate the Eid with their families. Uh, and uh, uh, as considered the biggest festival of Muslim world at Bangladesh, so it is extended holiday and people are traveling uh, uh, in uh, and they are uh, busy in purchasing the gifts and the valuables for their uh, uh, near and dear ones. All right. Also, uh, the Eid holiday will merge with another national festival of Bangladesh, Pahela Boishak, the first day of the yes. traditional Bangla calendar. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, Pahela Baisak is the first day of uh, Baisak month and uh, Baisak month is the first month of uh, Bangla calendar, which is uh, still popular in Bangladesh. And so Pahela Baisak is also a national holiday. And it is on 14th uh, April. So it is uh, club, uh, being clubbed with the uh, Eid holidays. So uh, from uh, uh, today, on, I mean on 8th to 14th, uh, there is a holiday in uh, many RMG factories. And uh, government holiday will start, uh, uh, start from 10th because Eid is on 11th. So from 10th to 14th, almost one week uh, holiday will be uh, uh, there in Bangladesh. So uh, this this time, this both the festival are uh, uh, together, and so people are enjoying the extended uh, 
uh, week of holidays. I'm sure a lot of rejoicing happening there. Thank you so much, Parma, for joining us from there. And moving on, as total solar eclipse is set to occur on Monday, locals and tourists in Mexico are getting prepped to witness the celestial phenomenon. The eclipse is set to commence over the South Pacific Ocean with the first point of contact on continental North America being Mexico's Pacific coast at approximately 11.07 a.m. Banners advertising the astronomical event were seen across the city drawing astronomers and scientists alongside enthusiastic locals. While eclipse enthusiasts who traveled to Texas on Sunday to witness the solar eclipse expressed concerns that bad weather could ruin the astronomical spectacle. Came down here for the eclipse. We're keeping our fingers crossed for the weather. I've been looking for the, the weather forecast. I'm really hopeful that today like, it's going to be a very good day. You know, I really have high hopes. Um, I got the uh, certified safety eyewear. I got UV filters for my camera. Of course, uh, I'm hoping for clear skies um, so we can see the uh, the event in totality. And still to come on DD India News Hour. Election fever grips India with parties scrambling to secure victory. PM Modi to hold rallies in Maharashtra and Chhattisgarh. Parivartan Chintan, a trial service conference by the Indian Army is going to be held in New Delhi today, aims to propel integration efforts amongst the armed forces. And the iconic Qutub Minar lit up on Sunday, marking the UN International Day of Reflection on the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Lepakshi Khurana and time now for a quick recap of the headlines. Israel reduces troops in South Gaza, leaving just one brigade. Egypt State TV says progress made in discussions in Cairo through stocks. IAEA condemns drone attack on Zaporizhia nuclear plant, says attacks significantly increase accident risk. Election campaign picks momentum for parliamentary polls in India. Top leaders of various political parties to hold multiple rallies and roadshows to garner support for their candidates. And a total solar eclipse is set to occur on Monday. Mexico, US and Canada to witness solar eclipse will be not be visible from the Indian subcontinent. And now let's get you the latest in the world's largest democratic election in India. Well, the upcoming general elections have ignited a wave of political activity across India with parties scrambling to secure victory. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, after a day of campaigning in eastern states of Bihar and West Bengal, will now hold public meetings in Maharashtra's Chandrapur and Chhattisgarh's Pastar. And for more on this, we have a correspondent, Shishir Scheller, joining us from Mumbai. Well, Shishir, good morning. Uh, we have the first rally of Prime Minister in Chandrapur today, which goes to poll in the first phase. The intense looks of her battle in Maharashtra is evident, uh, with all the prominent figures from various political parties contesting this time. How important is it? Well, absolutely, Alipika. Uh, this is the first rally of Prime Minister in Maharashtra after the election is announced and that's the reason it's quite important from Maharaj's perspective. Well, why Prime Minister is coming to Chandrapur first, there's a reason behind it because uh, the 
the Vidarbha region of Maharashtra uh, is known as the powerhouse of BJP. Earlier, it was a Congress bastion. Uh, but in the you know, a few years, we have seen that how BJP has tackled uh, the entire Vidarbha region. Especially Eastern Vidarbha, if you talk about, last time Eastern Vidarbha's, particularly Chandrapur seat was won by the Congress candidate, uh, Baru Dhanurkar. Uh, uh, no, uh, but after his demise, uh, now his wife, uh, Pratibha Dhanurkar, will be contesting Chandrapur uh, constituency from Congress. And from BJP, we also uh, we have uh, uh, Sudhir Mungantivar. Now, of talking about the experience of these two uh, candidates here, uh, Mr. Mungantivar looks quite strong at this point in time because he's also Environment Minister of Maharashtra and was in po active politics uh, since last few decades. And that's the reason, uh, you know, as far as this point in time, experience-wise, if you look at uh, you know, both the candidates, uh, then probably Sudhir Mun Mungantivar has got the upper hand here. Uh, talking about the particular region, the Eastern Vidarbha region, it has uh, two important constituencies, uh, especially the Chandrapur and the Gadchiruri uh, uh, constituency here. When Prime Minister uh, uh, will come to Chandrapur, uh, the people from Gadchiruri Chimur uh, will also be coming uh, to listen to Prime Minister. And that's the reason this particular Vidarbha region is quite important from the BJP's perspective, from the NDS perspective as well. Uh, well, uh, the issues we talk about... Uh, the, uh, Chandrapur and probably uh, these uh, adjoining areas is known for its industrial development. Uh, we have seen some of the cement factories. Uh, we have also seen the power companies have been operating here. And that's the reason uh, uh, quite a good number of employment have been generated in Chandrapur district. As far as the Gachiril district, the adjoining district is concerned, uh, that is also we have seen it's quite a bit affected because of Naxal and that's the reason a special attention given by the Maharashtra government. Uh, especially on the job employment also and the development of the Gachiru and Chivur is concerned. So these are the issues probably will come for the agenda and for the discussion for the people. Now the contested uh, who will be contesting this election have to uh, probably uh, no, uh, put forth the issues that how right. uh, these issues can be resolved from people's perspective and that's the reason. Uh, Sudhiri Mungantivar has already started his rally. On the other hand, Pratibha Dhanurkar is also connecting people and convincing them that how probably in future she will work for them. When the Prime Minister will be in Chandrapur, these issues will be quite important. At the same time, the people are eagerly waiting that what are the issues that Prime Minister will raise uh, from the stage here in Chandrapur. Right. Also, uh, Shishin Maharashtra holds great significance, as we all know, for all political parties uh, due to the state having the second highest number of Lok Sabha seats. Uh, How is the political scene uh, heating up overall there? Well, absolutely. Uh, 48 seats uh, Maharashtra will be having uh, for the parliament election and that's the reason. Uh, especially the first important step is announcing the candidature. We have seen here that the uh, NDA alliance and the India alliance have almost finalized their list here. A uh, few numbers, a uh, few candidates are still yet to be announced here, but most of the work is done. And that's the reason we have seen here that all those uh, whose name has been announced have already swung into action and started the election rallies here. Starting from Vidarbha region, as I told you, the second will be Marathwada region, then the uh, Western Maharashtra region and the Konkan region. That's how the entire election will pan out in Maharashtra in five phases. Uh, and that's the reason there will be, uh, uh, you know, star campaigners will be campaigning across Maharashtra from both the sides, from NDA side as well as the uh, India side. Uh, the star campaigner list have also been announced here and that's the reason we've seen uh, that these campaigners are actually roaming around to all these places here uh, and wooing uh, the voters that how they can, you know, vote in their favour. The issues probably that we have seen here that how uh, the Maharashtra has developed so far uh, and the various developmental uh, uh, no, schemes announced by the government, the current government, that is a major aspect that uh, probably uh, the, in India Alli the NDA alliance probably would put forward. As far as the India alliance is concerned, uh, they will talk about that what kind of change they want to bring uh, in Maharashtra and what would be uh, their perspective. So obviously, uh, you know, it's kind of an election uh, celebration mood that we have seen in across Maharashtra. The continuous campaigning rallies by the candidature, the star campaigners meeting people, uh, public rallies, road shows, uh, the entire things have started here. And for the next one month till 20th of May is the last, uh, you know, uh, the phase election in Maharashtra. Right. Uh, the entire election fervor will continue. Right. Thank you so much, Shishir, for all that update from Maharashtra itself. And India's Home Minister Amit Shah will be kicking off his poll campaign in Assam. He will hold a meeting in the Bishwanath district. Assam comprises of 14 constituencies and will be voting in three phases, the first, second and third of the elections.
Also, India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh will begin the campaign in Tamil Nadu and will be there for two days. Tamil Nadu will vote in first phase of elections, that is on the 19th of April, and will be contested on 39 seats. Meanwhile, Congress leader Rahul Gandhi is scheduled to hold two rallies in Madhya Pradesh. Gandhi will campaign in Mandla and Shahadol districts and will be his first visit to Madhya Pradesh after the announcement of election dates. Madhya Pradesh will vote in four phases, the first, second and third and fourth on April 19, 26, May 7th and 13th respectively. The central state of India accounts for 29 seats in general elections. Also, Congress leader Sachin Pilot is also scheduled to address election public meetings in the state of Rajasthan. He will be visiting Sikar, Junju, Jaipur, Rural and Arwal. On the other hand, Aam Admi Party AAP National Leader and Delhi Government Minister Atishi will be making her mark in the SAM campaign starting from today onwards. Well, today will also be the last day for the candidates eligible for the second phase of the election to withdraw their nomination papers. The second phase of elections will be on the April 26th and will see 89 Indian Parliament constituencies go to the polls. Well, India's space achievements can now be seen as an animated show at a planetarium in the southern state of Bangalore. To inform youngsters and evoke interest in them about India's space missions, the Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium will be showcasing a sky show produced by the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. The theme of the show is Indian Space Odyssey. Sounding rockets to Gaganyaan, Did India's Aisha Khanum has more on this. The planetarium shows in Bangalore are no longer restricted to watching the Milky Way galaxy or stargazing. The Indian Space Research Organization is now simplifying its success stories and bringing it to the young minds. The Gaganyan story will now be seen in the planetarium in simple language which the students and common man can understand. The 30-minute show's prime highlight is its animation of the various aspects of the Gaganyan mission and the accurate replication of the spacecraft through various videos and visuals of the process. The video discusses the training of four astronauts at the Human Space Flight Center along with the meticulous preparation for the launch. Speaking at the premiere of the Odessi show, A.S. Kiran Kumar, former chairman of ISRO, said if we want more space activities in the country, we should bring the narrative forward with such videos. The government is also looking at how Indians can land on moon by 2040. So it's exciting times ahead. But then if more and more space activities have to happen in the country, we also need to make sure that we bring in this narrative to the next generation and the public. And through these such activities, make them aware of what is happening. Post Chandrayaan 3's success, the interest of the youngsters in aerospace has grown manifold. This special show is open to public every day at the planetarium. The JNP is also making efforts to take the sky show to other states across the country. Aisha Khanum reports for DD India. And now let's take a look at other stories making news today. Sunday marked the UN International Day of Reflection on the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. In solidarity with the people of Rwanda, India lit up the Qutub Minar in New Delhi. Secretary Damu Ravi represented India at the 30th commemoration of the genocide in Kigali. The Indian Army is going to hold a tri-service conference called Parivartan Chintan in New Delhi today. The conference aims to propel jointness and integration efforts amongst the armed forces. It will be the first ever conference of the heads of all tri-service institutions and member of varied branches. A day-long discussion will be chaired by Chief of Defence Staff General Anil Chauhan. 
India's Naval Transmitting Station commemorated its 55th anniversary in Vishakhapatnam on Sunday. The event included various activities including interdepartmental sports competition, tug of war, best garden competition and cleanup drive with cultural show featuring in-house performances by unit personnel and their family members. Indian Meteorological Department predicted light to moderate rainfall accompanied by thunderstorms and hailstorms over east, central and peninsula India for the next four days. Scattered to fairly widespread moderate rainfall will occur over various regions including Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, West Bengal, Odisha and Maharashtra till Thursday. And still to come on DD India News Hour. In Indian Premier League, Lucknow Super Giants defeat Gujarat Titans by 33 runs. Liverpool couldn't get past Manchester United in Premier League clash. And Russell Cook, the man nicknamed Hardest Giza, has successfully run the full length of Africa. The land of Dravidians, Tamil Nadu, goes to polls in one go. How will the National Party's alliance face the political heat with the regional satraps? What are the issues that could find resonance among the voters as India decides? Will the vote share increase help the National Parties get a foothold in the minds of the people? Watch Why Tamil Nadu Matters on the Great Indian Election at 8.30 p.m. IST and 1500 hours GMT only on TV India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Nepak Shikuran and on to some business news now. Asian shares started the week on a subdued note on Monday, while dollar firmed as investors wait when the U.S. Federal Reserve will start cutting rates in the wake of yet another blowout jobs report. Global crude oil prices fell nearly 2% and gold prices slumped 1% after scaling record high on Friday as U.S. Treasury yields remain elevated. MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan was 0.26% higher, while Tokyo's Nikkei rose 1%. Various China mainland stocks reopened after extended holidays from Thursday, with the blue chip go on 0.5% lower. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index rose 0.33%. Brazilian Supreme Court Justice Alex Rindre de Moraes opened an inquiry into Elon Musk for obstruction of justice involving social media company X. According to a court document, Musk is challenging a decision by Moraes ordering his social media platform X to block certain accounts. Musk earlier on Sunday posted that X will lift the restrictions because they were unconstitutional. If X fails to comply with the order to block certain accounts, the company will be fined 19000 74 US dollars per day. And Australia's major supermarkets could face fines of up to 6.6 .6 million if suppliers and growers are not treated fairly as it proposed to make a voluntary grocery code of conduct mandatory. Under the proposed rule, supermarkets with annual revenue of over $6 million will fail under the, fall under the mandatory code. That list currently includes Australia's largest independent grocery supplier, Woolworths. The interim government report did not recommend big supermarket operators should be forced to divest assets to improve competition. You're watching DD India News on time now for some sports news. Lucknow Super Giants defeated Gujarat Titans by 33 run in their IPL 2024 match at Ekana Cricket Stadium on Sunday. The Gujarat side could not mount a strong chase of 164 and ended at 130 all out as LSG's pacer Yash Thakur 5 for 30 and spinner Krunal Pandey's impactful performance. 
Yash also became the first bowler in IPL 2024 to bowl a double wicket maiden. For Gujarat, only opener B. Sai Sudarshan could offer some resistance. Earlier, Marcus Choynes made a fine 50 as LSD made 163.45. LSD rode on Choynes' solid effort to reach a par total. Other contributions came from skipper KL Rahul and Nicholas Puran. For GT Pacers, Umesh Yadav and Darshan Nalkande took two wickets apiece. And Mumbai Indians ended its three-match losing streak this season after they trounced Delhi Capitals by 29 runs on Sunday in Mumbai to clinch their maiden win. The host posted 234 for the loss of five wickets after Romario Shepard smashed 32 runs in the final over of the T20 cricket match. Shepard came out of nowhere to slam a 10 ball 39. Shepard and Tim David had added 53 runs in the last three overs to help Mumbai Indians set up the imposing total. In reply, Delhi Capitals lost opener David Warner early, though Prithvi Shaw and Abhishek Porel added 38, 88 runs to keep the visitors in the hunt. But other batters failed to measure up to the challenge. Jaspreet Bumrah snapped up both Shaw and Porel to put the brakes on Capitals' scoring rate. As the run rate began to mount, Tristan Stubb went ballistic to make 25 balls, 71 not out. The right-handed batter smacked as many as seven sixes and three fours, but his effort could only reduce the margin of defeat for Delhi, who lost a flurry of wicket towards the end to finish at 205 for 8. Well, defending champions and five-time winners, Chennai Super Kings are set to host the Kolkata Knight Riders at the M.A. Chidambaram Stadium in Chennai today. The two-time IPL champions are second on the table with three wins out of three. While Chennai Super Kings are desperate to get back to winning ways, but the face KKR challenge has, they have been a force to reckon with in the ongoing season. After winning the first two matches, CSK lost the way and suffered defeat in the last two to drop down in the points table. Chennai Super Kings have enjoyed a fairly good run against the Kolkata Knight Riders. KKR too have had their fair share of wins against the men in yellow and have won three games at Chip Hawk. In 28 matches played between the two sides, Chennai have won 18 games while Kolkata have won 10 matches up till now. Tennis player Sumit Nagal became the first Indian to enter the Monte Carlo Masters single main draw in 42 years, beating Facundo Diaz Acosta of Argentina in a three-setter in the final qualifying round on Sunday. Nagal, ranked 95th in the world, defeated his world number 55 rival 752662 in a grueling match that lasted two hours and 25 minutes. Nagal will meet world number 35 Matteo Arnaldi of Italy in the first round of the main draw in the clay -torn court tournament. The 26-year-old Nagal was following the footsteps of the legendary Ramesh Krishnan who had made it to the main draw of the same tournament in 1982. Well, Liverpool squandered the opportunity to return to the top of the Premier League as they were held to a draw in another Old Trafford thriller with Manchester United. Manager Jurgen Klopp and his players paid the price for missing numerous chances, having overrun the host for long periods. Liverpool only had a Luis Diaz strike to show for almost a total first-half superiority in which they had 15 shots to none from United. Liverpool now lies second behind leaders Arsenal on goal difference with Manchester City a point further back in the third place. In men's hockey, India went down against Australia 2-4 in the second match of the five-match series in Perth on Sunday. India led at the half-time 2-1 despite trailing to an early goal. Drag flicks from Jugrat Singh and Harman Preet Singh put them in a good position. But in a third-quarter blitz, the Australians stomped back to score three goals. For Australia, Jeremy Hayward scored a brace while Anderson Jacob and Nathan Ephraimos netted one goal each. India now trailed the five-match hockey. Hockey Test Series 0-2 after they were thrashed to 5-1 in the opening match. 
And on to some cycling now. Reigning world champions Netherlands, Matthew van der Poel, scotched home solo to a second successive victory in the fastest ever edition of Paris. Robeck simultaneously becoming the first rider in 11 years to clinch the Tour of Flanders Roblox double. Second place in the historic Robax velodrome was Jasper Philipsen for a 1-2 for Alpesin Dorsenik outspinning Mads Pedersen in third and Nils Pollitt fourth. Matthew van der Poel broke his own record time in process after a stunning solo attack. The Dutch world champion pounced 60 kilometers from the finish and went to on to beat the mark he set last year by almost three minutes. It was a sixth win and a monument, the name given to road cycling's five most prestigious one-day races. In golf, a young Indian-American Akshay Bhatia won Texas Open on Sunday, defeating Denny McCarthy in a sudden death playoff at the end of a dramatic final round of the PGA Tours Texas Open in San Antonio. Bhatia, who is now the last qualifier to the Masters, went into the final round with a four-shot lead, but a remarkable back nine from McCarthy forced Swiss to play off. And after months of relentless determination and unwavering commitment, Britain Russ Cook successfully completed his monumental journey across Africa on Sunday. 27-year-old Cook, nicknamed Hardest Giza, embarked on the remarkable journey last April from Cape Achilles, South Africa, finishing in Ras Angela, Bizete, Tunisia. Over 352 days, he traversed 16,000 kilometers through 16 countries along Africa's west coast, becoming the first person to run the length of the entire continent. All right, that's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Lipak Shikurana from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour.